very much, Joanna and John, Randy, and uh, everybody. It's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here in Stanford and to, uh, and to have the opportunity to talk to all of you about Brexit. Um, Stanford uh, is one of the most internationally engaged and savvy communities in, in America, and firms based here thrive by accurately appraising economic and political trends around the world and assessing their effects. So it's truly an honor to be asked to join you, and I look forward to as much uh, to our discussion afterwards, because I'm sure I'm going to benefit greatly from the perspectives of this knowledgeable audience. Now my, uh, as Joanna said, my uh, comments tonight are in, uh, informed in part by three actual demand studies on Brexit. The one that I led that estimated the economic impact of various Brexit scenarios. The second one uh, exploring the impact of Brexit on defense and security issues. And a third one that used um, sort of economic uh, discrete choice methods to tease out what the British public really wanted from Brexit. I'll mention those findings as relevant later on. Now, at the beginning of last month, the Daily Telegraph in London reported that the British government had banned April Fool's jokes. <laughs> because with the current state of the Brexit process, no one really could really tell what was a joke and what wasn't. It was, of course, itself an April Fool's joke, but kind of only just. Uh, the lead paragraph of the same here, the lead paragraph of the New York Times uh, article on another failure of Parliament to pass the Brexit uh, withdrawal uh, agreement or any Brexit option. Uh, the New York Times called it Brexit's long-running theater of the absurd. Now, I think this is a little unfair to Samuel Beckett and Albert <laughs> Jack to have a better judge, uh, a better fix on their plot points than Mrs. May has had. So what have we learned from what's happened so far in Brexit, what's likely to happen, and what will it mean for business and the U.S. more broadly? That's what I hope to, to uh, tackle in the next uh, few minutes, and hopefully together and through our discussion, we'll sort this thing out. So I expect that you've been following the dramatic events, but I can assure you that nothing similar has ever happened in history. But to, reduce, to inform the discussion, I thought I'd start by giving the reduced Shakespeare version of uh, Britain's relationship with the EU, and then highlight a couple terms that are important for the post-Brexit trade relations uh, options. And I promise it'll be worth it uh, later. Now, we sometimes forget that the European Economic Community later renamed the European Union, they're not two different things, it's a renaming of the one thing, is a direct result of one of the more far-sighted acts of American diplomacy, the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan required that the Europeans cooperate economically in order to qualify for the assistance that they so badly needed after the war. And one result of the Marshall Plan, one early result was of the Marshall Plan was the coal and steel community in 1951 linked France and Germany. That shared experience in rebuilding Europe's industrial capacity and the U.S. pressure to reduce intra-European trade barriers led the Europeans to create the European Economic Community. And when the Treaty of Rome did that in 1957, Britain chose to stay out. In the 1960s, when they saw how much faster continental Europeans were growing because of the EEC, the UK changed its mind and applied to join. But actually, Charles de Gaulle vetoed the British applications, several British applications to join. After de Gaulle passed from the scene in 1973, Britain finally became a member of the EEC, along with Ireland and Denmark. But the British had second thoughts almost immediately, led by the Labour Party and the Socialist Left, that were concerned about capitalism uh, and the EEC. So a referendum was held only two years later, in 1975, and the decision to stay in 1975 was adopted very strongly with the support of the Tory party, ironically enough. Over the decades that follow, though, British Euroscepticism has grown, especially in the Tory party, egged on by Margaret Thatcher's objections to budget formulas and perceived loss of power to Brussels. 
a lot of wildly exaggerated scare stories about in the British tabloid press about what the EU meant to Britain, and more recently anxieties about migration and the supposed relationship between EU membership and tough economic times in Britain's Rust Belt. So to cope with these corrosive Tory party divisions on subjects, in 2013, then Prime Minister David Cameron proposed that if the Tories won the next election, the UK would renegotiate key aspects of the UK's relationship with Brussels and put the result to a national vote as to whether to stay in. Well, inspired by such a choice to vote on EU membership, a revved up Tory party won the plurality, in, won the majority in 2015, surprising many pundits. Prime Minister Cameron won some minor concessions from Brussels and scheduled the referendum for June 23rd. Cameron himself uh, campaigned for Remain, though he thought the, <coughs> uh, he allowed the Tory front branch to campaign for whatever side that they wanted. But in the event, the British public decided by March 52 to 48% to leave. Cameron resigned, Ter Theresa May took over as Prime Minister with a mandate to make Bre Brexit happen. That's the reduced Shakespeare version. <laughs> now, a couple key terms I just thought I'd explain that have an important bearing on the debate. Migration to Britain was a key issue for Brexiters. But free movement of peoples is guaranteed by the European Union Treaty. It means that any EU citizen can freely live and work in any other EU member state. It's one of the four freedoms of the treaty, with the others being free movement of goods, free movement of capital, and free movement of services. It's part of EU orthodoxy that the, free, that the four freedoms are indivisible, interrelated, and states can't pick and choose among them. Article 50, you'll hear a lot of reference to Article 50. Article 50 in the Treaty of European Union sets the terms for any departures. These terms are very unfavorable to the leaving country. Once it gives notice, it's out in two years, unless all the other EU countries agree to an extension. Now, Britain is the first go for the Article 50 process. And in applying it, the EU very much sees itself as setting precedents. A couple other things to mention. The European Union is a customs union, which means that it applies a common external tariff to all goods from outside the EU and no tariffs at all on trade between its members. But until 1992, it did maintain border posts to check that the products traded, even though they didn't have tariffs, met regulatory standards and um, regulations and, and uh, abided by quotas and so forth. Now, to eliminate internal borders, the EU passed over 250 separate laws in the 1980s to create a single market, which is called the EC92 program. And the EU today has a customs union with Turkey, but actually allows, uh, on special conditions, Norway and Switzerland to participate in the single market. And that's why one of the options in the Brexit uh, debate is the Norway option. That's a single market option. But both Norway and Switzerland pay the EU big bucks to participate in the uh, single market. Now, the EU has free trade agreements with a number of other countries, most notably Canada and Korea, and they're, uh, they're negotiating with Japan. In free trade agreements, participants eliminate tariffs between them, but they maintain their own tariffs to the rest of the world. Um, they have border checks as well. Now, our NAFTA, that I, as uh, Joanna mentioned, I negotiated the work on, is, um, is an FTA. Uh, and our agreements otherwise with Korea and Australia and Israel and many other countries are FTA. Now, if Brexit happens, we're discussing the idea of an FTA between Britain and the US, but we'll talk about that later. Britain had formally noticed, it gave notice under Article 50 to the um, EU that it would withdraw uh, on March 29, 2017. That meant under Article 50, the deadline for it to leave the EU was March 29, 2019. And during those two years, uh, Britain has negotiated with some difficulty a, a withdrawal agreement that sets the terms of departure. And the main issue in negotiating the withdrawal agreement is how to treat trade on the island of Ireland. 
the Irish and on their behalf, the EU, were concerned that if the UK withdraw from the single market, it would again require a hard border between Ireland and the UK province of Northern Ireland. And that would undermine the Good Friday Accord, which brought peace to the Ireland. Now you understand why I explained the difference between the customs unions and FTAs. In the withdrawal agreement, the EU insisted on inclusion of an unlimited so-called backstop that committed the UK to keep Northern Ireland within the single market, no matter what else happened, unless the EU agreed that an equivalent solution had been worked out. This, in turn, was highly unpopular in the British Parliament because it effectively kept the EU, would keep the EU, within the EU, uh, would keep, keep the UK within the EU Customs Union indefinitely and committed it to applying EU rules that it would have no say in, in uh, establishing. Not much of a Brexit leaders thought. This withdrawal agreement, along with the general non-binding <coughs> political declaration on future relations and a, tr a related transition plan, are collectively called Theresa May's deal. Um, this is the deal that failed to gain a majority from three times in Parliament. Now, why have we come to this point, and what have we learned from the process so far? The first general point to make is that leaders did not expect to win the referendum in 2016. The unexpected nature of the Brexit process had fundamental implications for the course of the negotiations and the consequent political future for, Brexit, for Britain. Since they didn't expect to win, they didn't have the support of the government's policy apparatus, Brexit advocates never resolved the basic contradictions in their argument for leaving. When the May government tri started trying to make Brexit mean Brexit, as it was said, these contradictions were not attacked first. So, leavers had two mutually contradictory impulses. On the one hand, they, uh, <clears throat> many of them make anti-immigration, nativist, and anti-globalization arguments that are similar to what one hears in the U.S. On the other hand, they envisage Britain as a Singapore of the Atlantic, freed of the burdensome EU trade policy shackles and much able to compete in world trade markets. For the first group, leavers insisted on exiting the single market and stopping free movement, making a Norway single market uh, solution untenable. And for the second, trade policy independence was the supreme goal, which ruled out a customs union and immediately put at risk the Good Friday solution. If leavers had all been on one side or the other, or had thought through the issues before the referendum, it might have gone much more smoothly. And of course, the pervasive London tabloid uh, exaggerations of what the EU was all about made serious policy discussions that much tougher, especially in the social media age. And second is, a part, in part as a result, the negotiations have been messy on the British side. One might say shambolic. <laughs> From the outset, Theresa May decided that she had to keep the Tory leavers on side for the purpose of party unity. That drove the early Article 50 filing before she really knew what she wanted, which also threw away much British leverage with the EU. There's no evidence that in the first year, 2016 to 2017, Her Majesty's government understood at all what a problem it would be to keep the Irish border barrier-free after Brexit in order to protect the Good Friday Agreement. London didn't establish an early and cooperative problem-solving approach to Dublin, even though it should have been clear that both countries had a problem to solve. But in any case, Dublin put its chips on Brussels to serve its interests. In London, there was also rapid turnover in key ministers, and the government sidelined the Foreign Office while creating two new ministries, one for negotiations with the EU, and one for negotiations with third countries. Britain has a strong cadre of Europeanists and a tradition of success in working in Brussels. Yet Mrs. May made no use of her retired mandarins, forced out the UK's ambassador to the EU when he made inconvenient, though accurate, observations. Thus, British was, the British were at a disadvantage in the field, even though they had all-stars on the bench. Third, and by contrast, the EU's management of the Brexit process was extraordinarily good. 
The selection of Michel Barnier as the lead negotiator was inspired. It was experienced as a commissioner, deep understanding of Brussels, and an instinct for managing the member states. He recognized right away that the EU's biggest challenge would be staying unified, given the wide range of country interests. Barnier imposed the no dialogue until you file Article 50 notice rule right away, and then he insisted on settlement of withdrawal terms before any discussion of future relations. Both of these demands had no clear basis in the treaty or any precedent, but they served to keep the EU together and the UK at a disadvantage. The UK was so conflicted and disorganized, and Mrs. May was under so much under pressure by the hardcore leaders that it didn't even fight these early battles. In the RAND Economic Impact Studies Game Theory chapter, we put it that the EU knew from the outset it was playing a zero-sum game in which it could only win if the, EU could, if the UK could be seen to be losing. The UK initially wasn't sure what game it was playing and against whom. Fourth, Theresa May's political judgments and instincts were poor, which aggravated the UK's difficulties. The decision of uh, Theresa May to call a snap election in the summer of 2017 after denying any such attention, intention was her worst decision. May was a wooden campaigner, and despite going into the election with public opinion polling in her favor, she lost the Tory majority, elevated Jeremy Corbyn in his own eyes and those of the labor base, and greatly empowered the DUP, the right-wing Ulster Unionist Party that after the election supplied the critical 10 votes to allow Mrs. May to form a government. Once the DUP had its kingmaker power over Mrs. May's government, it made sure to block any Irish border solutions that treated Northern Ireland differently from the rest of the UK, which has become May's central dilemma in getting a deal through Parliament. Now, all of these factors have greatly weakened May's endgame. And yet, as we've seen in recent months, and as other leaders occasionally are when standing at the edge of the abyss, Theresa May is so weak that she has a strength of the sort. Her withdrawal agreement first lost in January by the biggest margin in British history, yet she decisively held off the Tory leadership challenge uh, thereafter. And a Labour-initiated vote of no confidence in January. Corbyn's outside the mainstream leftism is unrelated and corrosive anti-Semitism problems in his own party have helped cement for May in no alternative position. Maggie Thatcher should have been so lucky. <laughs> so what is the current situation and prospects? As I mentioned earlier, under the Article 50 process, once the UK officially notified the EU in March 2017 of its intention to leave, it was to be out two years hence, with or without a deal, unless the EU unanimously postponed the deadline. In mid-March, when Mrs. May had failed to secure a parliamentary majority for the withdrawal agreement in two tries, the European Council gave the UK a two-week reprieve to try again. Now, as you may recall from the press coverage at the time, Parliament held a variety of so-called indicative votes. The withdrawal agreement again failed to win a majority, leaving without a deal, so-called no-deal option, failed to win a majority. Holding a new referendum failed to win a majority. A customs union failed to win a majority. This is consistent with the RAND Europe discrete choice study I mentioned, which demonstrated even with the most sophisticated analytical techniques that no one alternative can command a majority of the public. What did win a majority in Parliament in early April, but not a big one, was to ask the EU again for more time so as to not to crash out without a deal with the border chaos and economic costs that it might entail with that. The core political problem is that 50 to 100 hardline Eurosceptical Tories and 10 Northern Irish DUP MPs will not vote for the, Euro the government's deal because its backstop might leave the UK indefinitely stuck in a customs union with the EU and Northern Ireland stuck in the single market. And Labour won't support the withdrawal deal either since it doesn't want to enable or take responsibility for a Tory Brexit. Faced with the stalemate and the fearful of no deal chaos, the EU reluctantly did again what it often does. It stopped the clock. 
On April 10th, the European Council approved a second postponement of Brexit, this time until October 31, 2019. Or as I put it, the reality show that is Brexit got renewed for a new season. <laughs> Such a delay means that the UK must compete in the European Parliament elections that are scheduled for May 23rd, even though they're officially committed to leaving. Meanwhile, Theresa May has played one more card, perhaps one of her last. Towards the end of April, she invited her Labour Party counterpart, Jeremy Corbyn, to see if the two parties could find a solution that could command some parliamentary majority. Thus far, Labour has been vague on what it wants because it too is divided, many MPs representing Rust Belt constituencies favoring leave, and many left-leaning urban communities favoring remain. Labour's solution has been to support a customs union with a confirmatory vote, otherwise known as a new referendum, which, if agreed, could mean the end of free movement, but it would keep the UK within the EU's tariff system to hold down job losses. Labor also insists on applying EU labor standards and other regulations that are much hated by Tory business. The latest from London on these talks, even this morning, is that they're not going well and we're unlikely to see a solution along those lines. Now, the, EU, the UK is still a member of the EU, at least until Halloween. <laughs> the Brexit uh, chain massacre, it's called. Yeah. Um, I, I like to think of the April developments as a game of chicken in which the EU saved Britain from a no deal crash by swerving at the last minute. So, what happens next? As I mentioned, the British candidates are competing in the European parliamentary election. Uh, that is necessary because otherwise, the new E, the European Parliament, takes office. July 1 might be legally questionable. As both Tories and Labour lost considerable ground in the municipal elections last week, for the EP voting, all eyes will be on the newcomer parties. Nigel Farage's Brexit party on the Leave side and the Change UK party on the Remain side, as well as the Liberal Democrats, all of whom won big last week, for an indication of which way the British winds, political winds are blowing. And for the next uh, few months, it looks like the stalemate and can kicking will continue. So we made a joke this morning that uh, uh, Theresa May is wasting borrowed time. Um, <laughs> the EU looks to be steadfast in its view that the only negotiated withdrawal deal is one that it reached with the UK last November with the backstop. The EU is also willing to consider other de desired outcomes for future relations, including a customs union. Uh, as long as the backstop stays in place. Mrs. May and her weakened government seem likely to continue to seek votes for the negotiated withdrawal on the argument that it's the most sure and least disruptive way to achieve Brexit. Maybe the votes will be there. But if not, when the end of the second Article 50 extension approaches the end of October, will be another decision point. Either the EU extends Article 50 again, or perhaps it may not have the unanimity it needs to do so. And so it might throw the UK out without a deal. So it's worth a moment to consider what a no deal crash out scenario might look like. That scenario, fortunately not too likely, would have sharp economic consequences for Britain, but would also hurt the EU. In a no deal scenario, the UK and the 27 would be obliged immediately to put in place trade barriers and inspections on trade that now happen seamlessly. It's as if we put a border uh, with uh, New York. British planners uh, have discussed waving through imports from the EU on a transitional basis and relying on uh, manufacturer certificates as to what has been traded. But uh, the plans also involve cutting agricultural duties to prevent a uh, food price spike. <coughs> necessarily quite unpopular among farmers in Britain. Fundamentally though, new deal means, no deal means no preferential access to major markets in Europe, and this is quite damaging to the British economy. Our study conservatively estimated that it would cost 5% of GDP. That substantial segment of British manufacturing that, that depends on just-in-time value chain parts and component supply back and forth across the channel surely would be rendered non-competitive. So what does this mean for business? In the short term, by which I mean the next six months, little will change. Britain will remain a member of the single market and apply EU common external tariffs. 
The uncertainty, though, about the future is already affecting the plans of major foreign investors in Britain, such as Nissan, Honda, Panasonic, or Airbus. New manufacturing commitments are being deferred. Banks and other financial institutions are moving operations to other EU member states. Rand Europe has uh, incorporated our Brussels office as a Belgian nonprofit. And domestically in the EU, the political structure in the UK, the political uh, struggle over the form of Britain's post-membership relationship will continue. It will be important to US firms to follow that debate. But the reality is that tariffs and regulatory barriers between the US and the UK are not likely to change very much in the near term, even if the UK and the EU agree to put in place a free trade agreement. Only an FTA solution between the UK and the, and the EU would allow for a similar FTA with the US. Since in a customs union, the UK couldn't diverge from EU tariff levels. And even once a strategic direction is agreed, it will take years to work out the details and put the new agreements in place. So for US investors in the UK, they tend to be more focused on the domestic market and so less at risk to effects on their value chain manufacturing, depending, and, 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 and than Japanese firms. But if the British domestic economy is badly hit by a no deal, US owned firms would hurt, would, would uh, suffer as well. And it's conceivable that in a no deal scenario, port congestion and other problems with trade with the continent would extend clearance times for US exports to the UK as well. Beyond the impact on business, there's the very real question of what Brexit may mean for transatlantic defense and security cooperation. We undertook a study on that question and concluded that despite Brexit, the British commitment to NATO can be expected to continue unabated, even be strengthened. And the UK's likely, but the UK's likely straightened uh, economic circumstances may affect its capacity for defense investments. On the larger topic of security cooperation, including counterterrorism, counter narcotics, fight against money laundering, and the like, Britain may well set back transatlantic uh, Brexit may well set back transatlantic partnerships because with data sharing with the continent more difficult, it may limit what the UK and the EU can do together. In my judgment, the most important stake the United States has in the Brexit process is to ensure that the British withdrawal not lead to a broader disintegration of the EU itself. As I mentioned at the outset, the EU grew out of America's Marshall Plan vision. The EU's contributions to our security and economic prosperity are clear and continuing. Many feared at first that Brexit might potentially lead to a domino effect among other EU member states with uh, Eurosceptic political tendencies of their own. But the difficulties the British have faced in making a go of Brexit, increasingly self-evident costs of the process are having a salutary effect on the other Eurosceptics. If only Britain had tried to reform the EU from inside, it would have had lots of allies. Now looking back, I think the Brexit process is full of irony and unintended consequences. Just a couple to mention. The road to Brexit, you'll recall, began with David Cameron promising to renegotiate the EU's, the UK's relationship to Brussels and hold a referendum. He saw this as a way to red Tory politics and Euroscepticism. The result has been the opposite, casting Britain out of the EU, tearing the Tory party apart. And now it appears that Brexit may even threaten the Labour Party's uh, stability. One the irony is that once the parties disintegrate, Britain may actually make, uh, find its politics more European. A second irony is that for UK leavers, it was all about the, the, the politics, the sovereignty enhancing part of being out of, uh, out of the EU. The economics never seemed to matter. But they thought that the EU would be easy. The Brexiters said that it would be easy to do a deal uh, with, the, with the EU because uh, for them they needed to preserve their market in the UK for Mercedes and Sydney and others. In fact, neither one of them has been motivated by economic uh, concerns at all. The third irony, perhaps the greatest of all, is that Brexiters campaigned to leave on the slogan that, British, that Britain would take back control. The process has demonstrated to all but the most ideological that Britain in reality has had little control of the process and the terms of Brexit. 
the EU has been in charge. And if and when it does lead, the UK's future outside of the EU will be one in which it must meet the standards and regulatory requirements of its larger trading partners, rather than setting its own. So precious little control even then. It's a cold, cruel world. What we've seen in the past few months, dramatic as it's been, is only the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. Whether or not the withdrawal agreement ever gets through Parliament, the road ahead will see many years of negotiations over those future relations, more dramatic votes in Westminster and the European Council, and more t political turmoil, especially in Britain. Though few really thought that this, about this process before it began, it turns out that raising trade barriers and withdrawing from political unions are as much trouble as creating them in the first place. Thank you very much. Make an observation at the start. I do have a question, but I'll make an observation at the start that the um, that the European Union um, has, as you mentioned, um, <coughs> an enormous um, need to prove to other people how difficult it would be. And the only thing I would say, just from my personal experience, is that I personally have never met a marriage. Uh, a successful marriage based upon the cost of divorce, which is apparently what the European Union position is. But I did want to comment on one factual thing you said, which you pointed out the four pillars, and you described one of the pillars of the European, and I was in Europe from European. The four freedoms. The, uh, the, was the freedom of movement of people. Mm -hmm. It is my belief that the treaty doesn't say that. The treaty says freedom of movement of labor. And it has been interpreted afterwards by the European court to they must have meant people. Well, you know, when people choose words, the words mean something. The freedom of movement of labor, to me, means if you've got a job in England, you can go to England got a job in France, you can go to France. That has been perverted and reinterpreted and is not in the treaty. The treaty says freedom of movement of labor. Thank you. Thanks very much. You may, you may well be right. I'm not familiar with the exact words of the treaty, but in a sense it doesn't matter because the freedom of movement of workers is, the, is what is politically controversial. That is to say, people, Bulgarians and Romanian plumbers coming to work in Britain is what has caused, in a sense, the lever um, movement to grow in, in Britain. And among the other weird things about this process was the fact that the, the unfortunate timing from the standpoint of London, uh, when they made the decision to put this, the, um, uh, the referendum in June of 2016, uh, they did so in advance of what became the largest migration crisis the EU has ever faced, which started in September of 2015 and continued until the end of March of 2016. Hundreds of thousands, hundreds of, no, no, these were, they were, these were Syrians and, uh, and others from the third world that were coming because of the deterioration of the situation in Syria. Hundreds of thousands of people all across uh, Central Europe, uh, terrible, TV pictures. None of that had anything to do with the UK. The UK at that time and now and forevermore has the ultimate authority to decide uh, about the entry of non-EU nationals into the UK. They never forewent that in the, in the course of the uh, treaty. And every EU member state makes its own decisions, although those that are within Schengen have to share uh, information about those that they've admitted, and they don't have to give them the right to work. But Bulgarians or Romanians or Hungarians, the UK made the decision uh, when those countries acceded to the EU not to give them a transition period and allow them to move to the UK immediately uh, to work. And, uh, and they actually are now suffering by the loss of uh, Eastern Europeans who have uh, crippled the national health uh, uh, program from leaving early. 
Yes. Uh, what if Scotland? What about Scotland? Well, that's a good point. Um, you know, if I had an hour to make this speech, I would have talked about Scotland because it's really quite relevant. Scotland, of course, was Cameron's first uh, referendum adventure uh, to deal with uh, Scottish nationalist um, aspirations. He gave them a referendum choice as to whether or not they wanted to withdraw from the, from the UK. And the notion among Scots was that they would then apply to join the EU. Uh, and that was a very close fought referendum, but it, in a sense, the UK won that one. And that is there, there are some who think that that may have made uh, Cameron overconfident in, this, in, in, the, uh, in the Brexit referendum. Uh, the Scots Nats, though, were themselves surprised by the failure to win the Scottish independence referendum in 2011, 12, something like that and uh, have been uh, playing their cards quite close to the best in the present uh, circumstances in Westminster. Um, and, uh, but it is thought that if there's a very disruptive, no deal Brexit, that um, uh, separatism in Scotland may well grow. And you know, uh, the way Brexit has worked, because of the Irish issues, and uh, to a lesser extent, the Scottish issues, Another irony may be that Brexit itself, designed to restore the UK to its imperial glory, might actually dismember, might result in dismemberment of the UK itself, another unintended consequence. Over here. Uh, now that all of Britain seems to realize how difficult it is to leave, which I believe wasn't the case when the vote was taken. True. Why don't they have a whole new referendum? It's a very good question. Uh, the, actually, the polling data have shown that there has not been a major shift in public opinion <coughs> within Britain about Brexit. In fact, if you ask the question uh, now, a lot of people would just want it over with. They're sort of tired of Brexit uh, focus. Um, the polling data that, you know, remember the, the vote in 2016 was 52-48 to leave. The latest polling data is about 52-48 the other way to stay. <laughs> but it's not an overwhelming thing, even though um, it's clear that the British public was really misled in the debate. Uh, a lot of the facts have been shown to have been um, uh, not facts. And uh, there was a lot of external um, financial assistance for the leavers. Uh, including from the Russians, uh, which was a little bit of a trial go. There was Cambridge Analytica, which was famous in our case. Uh, their first go was in the Brexit debate. I'm not sure they made much of a difference, but um, uh, a number of the major leavers uh, acquired funds for the support for the Leave campaign outside of the country. So you might think that the sort of nationalism, inherent nationalism in the British might be saying, well, wait a minute, you know, they've got us in this mess and it's not working. But that hasn't happened. People would just want to be done with it. Back in the back. In my family, which is British, the older generation were leavers. Yes. The younger generation were remainers. That's correct. Now what has happened three years later is some of the old generations have pooped off. Yes. And some of the old, younger generation have moved into voting age. Indeed. It is almost for sure, in my opinion, that it would be 52 to stay, 48 to leave, if anything even like that. Now, since leaving is a, young, is a decision which affects young people more than it affects older people, what are we doing? Well, you, you try and put that proposition in the US about climate change, you might have the same logic. The fact, that, the fact is that it's really very difficult for a, uh, a political system to disenfranchise uh, uh, some, some proportion of the voting population. But you're right. I mean, I, I think I have, been, I have felt for the last year that a new referendum fairly addressed with a factual basis and a calm campaign would find the British people coming down the other way. I, I think, you know, um, Joanna mentioned I, I served in Brussels. I was four years the head of economics uh, at the U.S. mission to, um, to Brussels uh, in, uh, in the 90s, in the Clinton administration. And I was astounded on how much the British dominated 
the, um, the Brussels policy making process. The British overperformed the French and the Germans and everybody else. They did their homework, they took the EU seriously, they got everything they wanted. Margaret Thatcher wanted a, rep, a, a, a rebate, she got a rebate. They want, didn't want to be in the Euro, they didn't get in the Euro. They wanted new things to be intergovernmental instead of community competence. Uh, they got that. They always were prepared and they got everything that they wanted. And as I mentioned, uh, they had a cadre of fantastic uh, operatives that came out of the foreign office. We, we just were blown away by their competence. But they've sidelined them all. Uh, and the Tories are in charge, the careerists are gone, and they never recognized in London how uh, accomplished they were getting Brussels to do what they wanted to do. And then they started into this negotiation with not a clue of where they were going. Yes, over here. Now, now that you mentioned Brussels, um, the EU without the UK has mm -hmm. ramifications. Sure. Given that voting is economically weighted yes. in the EU, Britain tends to vote with Germany. Yes, and the Swedes and the Danes. Right. And the, and without the them, though, the weight of the Italian and the French and the Spanish vote increases. Yes pretty significant that could have. Yes, I mean, there are there are consequences for the 27 itself. Uh, the long lines you mentioned, the long lines I mentioned, and that, that and we always had confidence that the EU would never do something really wacky because the British were involved and that they could mobilize uh, a rational uh, quadrant. Without them, time will tell what will happen. Uh, and it is, and that's why I think that this is a personal view, that for us, we should keep our eyes on Brussels. Uh, that the UK, if they choose to leave, they will leave, they will suffer, they will be a country like a Norway, like a Iceland, uh, you know, like Japan, a country that's sort of free-floating in the international system. They will be stuck with taking EU rules just like everybody else is if they want to trade with 500 million people in Europe. But what we really ought to be worried about is what happens to the rest. Because if nationalism returns uh, and the, the French and the Germans and the Poles are struggling for dominance and rearming against each other, that is de definitely not in our interest. Over here, yes. You, you liken the, the latest um, interaction between uh, Britain and the EU as a game chicken. Yeah. And you said that the EU swerved and gave the, the, the win, let's say, to Britain by letting them uh, continue on. Um, some analysts have also likened the uh, interplay between the Tories and the Labour coalitions as also a game of chicken, which will happen on Halloween this year. And some of them have actually said that it's more likely that Labour will swerve because they're more fearful of a no-deal Brexit than they are of a orderly Brexit, and they won't hold the ground as hard as Tories will and their coalition, thereby giving them confidence, the, the Tories, confidence not to, you know, continue, or to continue the, the path. Yeah, you may well be right. I, I, we, um, I, I made the reference uh, in our study after Brexit, uh, we have a whole chapter on game theory and Brexit. Uh, RAND is a game theory place, you know, so I had to have a chapter on game theory and Brexit. And when the, the young economist who was drafting that chapter came to me in the first draft, it had this whole thing on the game of chicken. I said, no, that's too simple, it's much more complicated. And you know, that's where we got into the, uh, some of the other uh, more sophisticated elements of game theory. But I thought that what, what happened in April was a, a, a game of chicken. And the British, either because they were too crazy to swerve or because uh, they couldn't swerve, they didn't swerve, but the British, the, the Brussels did swerve and, and helped them out. Uh, I think you're right about the incentives between the, uh, the, the, the Labour and, and the Tories. The, the Tories, uh, you know, they're, they're, they, they, there's a hundred and, so votes in the Tory party out of the majority of 260 or so, 250, that would uh, would go for a no deal right today uh, without any any problems. 
even though you know all the other issues, the, the Ireland problem and everything, are much much worse. They just are afraid that they will have Brexit yanked from them at the last minute. Uh, the the main objective of Corbyn, who is not very strong himself, Corbyn is the Labour leader, um, and not you know it's been a, a, a marginal character in British politics for 35 years. Uh, has been, don't get blamed for Brexit. Make it a Tory Brexit. Mm -hmm. And, um, <coughs> but the problem is that their position of sort of staying out of Brexit and letting the Tories self-destruct is kind of run out of runway. And they have to get engaged now because their own party is self-destructing. And that's why I sort of, in my irony point about how um, uh, this was all designed to, to to deal with this cancer at the heart of the Tory party, it's gonna blow up both parties. And uh, because whatever Corbyn does, he's got levers too. He's got levers from the uh, Rust Belt and the Midlands that are really as bad as, or as, as committed to leaving as, as, as any Tory is. And so uh, both parties uh, will, uh, no matter what the outcome, it's hard to imagine that British politics would be the same. Yes? So one thing you brought up was the Leave slogan of take back the UK. Take back control. Take back control. So if even if somehow Brexit could be resolved really well, the UK would still have to have and figure out trade agreements with other countries and agree to some of their regulations. So could this really be framed as an argument on national sovereignty? And is it possible for a successful state to maintain independence in our contemporary economic state? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, in, in reality, uh, the world, uh, the inter interdependent global economy, is moving towards uh, a few large poles. Uh, one of them is North America, the United States, and uh, Mexico and Canada. One of them is the EU, and the other it looks like it's China. Uh, and uh, increasingly, countries like Singapore or Japan or Korea, they don't have a choice. Uh, they need to follow the rules uh, or um, at successfully advocate that the rules be set at an international level. So a good example is 5G cell phones. So uh, there's a big, it's the new standards issue, right? Who's going to set the standards uh, and the performance requirements for 5G cell phones? And in the last generation, ironically enough, it was the EU that did it. Now, you know, I have an iPhone. Most of us have iPhones or, or uh, Androids or whatever. They're op they operate on a system that was the EU system. We had a system for transmission of cell phones called CD or CDMA, which was the system that was used by Verizon or, or AT&T. And, um, and the uh, Europeans basically uh, got together and through something called ETSI, which is the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, imposed as a fiat GSM, which was uh, it's in French, Global Standards Mobile, I think, something like that. And they basically, by putting together the world's largest market, they had economies of scale, and everybody went for GSM, even though CDMA allows for more data in smaller, smaller bandwidth. It was technically superior lost. 5G is going to be a, con a, 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 a competition between Europe, China and the US about who's going to set the 5G standards. And of course, we have this additional element of Huawei and the security parts of it. But even just on the standards themselves and the functionality, there's going to be a competition along that, those lines. But if you're Brazil or Australia or Japan, you're actually not going to determine how it's going to come out. You're going to have to take it. And that's just the facts of life. And so um, Britain's best strategy to maximize national sovereignty would have been to stay in the EU. At least that's my opinion. Yeah. Yes, sorry. A political question. Um, about this time last year, the economists floated the idea or reported the idea, I'm not sure which, that money interests were trying to persuade 
David Miliband, and David Cameron to help form a new party. Mm -hmm. I've not seen the economists mention it since, and I wonder if you have any insights so through whether that was just a trial balloon that didn't go anywhere, yeah. or whether there's any any discussions of a new party. I don't really know. I've seen David Miliband uh, in the last four or five months, and people ask him all the time if he's going to be the you know, white knight who's going to save British politics, and he totally refuses. Uh, says no, and I'm committed to the rescue committee. I'm committed to New York. I, you know, I tried that and I've lost. Uh, uh, Cameron, I don't know. Cameron might do, and you know, who knows? Uh, nothing is forever in politics. I guess if people can come back. Um, David Miliband is really a, a real, uh, a real talent, uh, and uh, you know, maybe if he felt that his country needed him and. Um, and the right circumstances were that way. He could be, uh, he could be brought back. Um, but I don't, I don't have any insights particularly. We're here. Yes. Just on your point, right now, about David Cameron. Yes. Do you think he's got any life left at all? <laughs> I mean, his his gap yeah, in all yeah. of this has been, in my opinion, fatal. He was a plunger, and uh, you know, won once, but uh, doubled down and went for the second time. I mean, had he simply asked for a supermajority in yes. the, in the Brexit referendum, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We would not. This conversation. We would not. And, and had the Syrian situation not deteriorated, I think, in uh, 2015, we also wouldn't have been having this conversation. Uh, there are a number of reasons we might not have been having this con conversation, but. Um, it is what it is. He, he is not, a, Tony Blair has actually emerged and is participating in the, in the Brexit debate. He's on television, uh, writing articles and so forth. David Cameron has been invisible. Uh, but I don't really know. Uh, I don't, I, I think um, it's hard to see his constituency. The Leavers don't like him. The Remainers certainly don't like him. So it's hard to imagine where he can come back. But it was a total miscalculation on his part. Agreed. And as I say, it could have been very easy for him to avoid it. Yes. The darn sight if, if it was happening, but he didn't think it was going to happen. Yeah. But not, and I guess we're hearing about Theresa May and the tough spot that she is in right now. He passed that on to her. Yeah. She was brave enough to take it. Right. She took it on. And I guess this was. You know, and, and seeing how her party has abandoned her in so many ways, it just speaks to the perfidity of politics. The fact that you can't count on anybody. Well, I think, I mean, that, that, that's probably... Even when you do take on what was an unbelievably difficult time. Wow. You know, that's probably the iron rule of politics. But uh, uh, I, I do, I have, um, I have to admit uh, uh, an admiration for Theresa May. Uh, Theresa May, um, she is, as I mentioned uh, in my remarks, a wooden campaigner. She, uh, the European Council, I found the reports that there was a European Council on May, March 20th, um, uh, and the Europeans, the European Council is the summit. It's all the other leaders of the 27 other member states. And they met, uh, and Theresa May came. And afterwards, the other leaders said they didn't have any sense from her as to what she was going to do. And I think that politicians, what you need to do, you know, politicians are like any kind of leadership thing. You need to basically communicate to people and make people sort of throw in with you because they believe that you have the right way to move forward and you can do it. And she is not a communicator. She has many admirable qualities. One of them is just doggedness. She's going to stay on task and she's going to not be put off by failure. She's not quitting. She's staying there. But the, her, her deficiencies I mean, her strengths are the strengths of a technocrat rather than the strengths of a politician. She doesn't, she, 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 when she retires from the scene, won't come back because of all of these characteristics of her. But in a sense, the withdrawal agreement, given the hand that she was dealt, may be the best outcome for them. Uh, and I try and tell Irish friends, 
I was in Dublin in April, and I tried to say, look, you know, uh, they weren't crazy when they said, put a time limit on the backstop or something like that, because what that will do is it actually gets it done and guarantees Ireland, and at the end of the time limit, you still have all the options you have now. You haven't given any up. But the Irish, you, you, know, I mean, you know you know what the Irish are like about the British. <laughs> 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 they don't trust them either. <laughs> 